Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, John Hubbard. And as you know, in season four, we've been going through Miter's book, 11 Strategies of a World Class Cybersecurity Operations Center, with our three authors, Ingrid Parker, Carson Zimmerman, and Catherine Erler. Hello, everyone. Welcome Hello. back. Hey, so, in this episode, we have made it to the second to last chapter, which is exciting on its own because we've got through nearly all of the book, yet we only have one exciting episode left, at least on book chapters. Maybe we'll do some bonus stuff. Uh, and also, this chapter happens to be about one of my favorite topics and perhaps some of yours as well, metrics, right? Measure imp uh, performance to improve performance. Uh, always an interesting topic, one that I always get questions on all the time from basically everyone all, all across the spectrum in security. So definitely looking forward to, uh, to this conversation here. Um, to start off this chapter, I think we probably want to frame this conversation in terms of the definitions you had laid out front, because we don't want to be using terms in ways that people are not exactly clear on as we continue through our conversation. So if we could start off uh, with discussing the three kind of things you immediately point out at the start of this chapter, which is your uh, metric slash measurement as one term, uh, KPI, key performance indicator as another term, and then assessments. Uh, Ingrid, could you take us through those? Sure. So measure and metric we use somewhat interchangeably. Um, but really all this is, is this is, this is a number that could be a count of something that could be a percentage that could be, you know, any number of ways that you get to that number, you know, or some other way that you're quantifying something, but it doesn't have meaning on its own. It really is just a thing. It doesn't tell you if it's good or bad. It doesn't tell you if that's what you were trying to do. It's, it's just a fact. Um, and it's something that you're going to bring up. The second thing that we talk about are KPIs. And so, you know, those are your key performance indicators. And they're really going, they're basically then taking those metrics and those measures and saying, okay, what does that mean to me? How are we actually using them? Do they, you know, does that mean that we are above or below, you know, doing what we intended to do, haven't hit our marks? Where are we going with it? And so they really work together. But needing to understand that a measure or a metric on its own doesn't have that meaning and you have to apply that meaning to your business so a number in one organization may have a different meaning than a number in a different organization even if they're the same the third term that we have in there is assessment and we just included in this case to talk about um really it's thinking about how you evaluate something that's going to result in that uh that measure or that metric and we included it here because sometimes when you think about an assessment within a SOC, you're thinking very specifically about, you know, a red team assessment or, you know, some other specific name for something. And we just wanted to call out the fact that, that you can do lots of assessments in order to come up with these numbers, but we weren't attaching a particular type of assessment to it. And so just wanted to acknowledge that it was different than you might think of from a SOC from, for the name assessment. So we just threw those in at the beginning, get people started. Um, again, just wanted to make sure that they were comfortable with the difference between a single number and what we might want to do, you know, in terms of actually applying that to our own organizations. There's, gotcha. <clears throat> there's two other definitions I'll add in that people usually get involved in when they get involved in a conversation around metrics and that are SLOs and SLAs, service level objectives and service level agreements. And the main distinction that I usually draw between them is an agreement is something you've actually officially agreed as an organization to meet. I mean, there, you know, it might be tied up in a contract or, or, or just something you say, this is, this is something we're going to do. Whereas an objective is, usually more aspirational and usually less in a contract. And then there's probably someone listening to this webcast today who is probably like, no, Carson, it's not quite like that. There's this formalism and this formalism. Okay, I, I got it. The, my purpose in bringing these up <clears throat> is that people often bring metrics into SLOs and SLAs. And that's why in any conversation, in fact, in the next probably 40 minutes or so, you're going to hear one of us use one of those terms as well, because they're all related. Gotcha. And I've definitely heard of the, the SLI too, the service level indicator yeah. mixed in with the SLO and the SLA as well. So yeah, uh, just so kind of uh, listeners and viewers are aware of those things. Good to do some level setting there. So if we're going to build a metrics program for a SOC, is there one of those types of things that we're going to lean more heavily on and what's going to make that decision? Well, I guess uh, I can jump in there. I would... Um... 
go back to that thing we've been emphasizing throughout, which think is think about the goals of what you're trying to do with those metrics. So before we decide, is it a KPI? Is it you know an SLO? Is it SLA? What is it? Um, think about what is it you want to measure? What do you want the SOC to be get better at? What do you want it to uh, talk to your executives about? What do you want to make sure that uh, you know expectations are set um, with your senior leadership and those others? So um, I would start with the goals of the measuring that you're going to do. Is there a discussion to be had? Um, well, there is a discussion. Which discussion should we be having <laughs> and with who about what those goals should be? Is I mean, this is probably an internal and external thing. Any specific positions or stakeholders or constituency kind of groups that you have experienced getting really good kind of goal setting conversations out of? I, I can start. Um, when, it, when folks new to security operations or even people who feel like they are downtrodden in the usual daily trudge of casework, um, often get mired and and feel like they don't know where to begin. And that's one of the, re that's actually that experience I've had and the, an experience I've seen from others is one of the things that inspired this chapter. And, you know, the way we broke this down is, is to think about the audience really is three distinct groups. There's the SOC itself. Um, there's the leadership directly above the SOC usually a cybersecurity apparatus or perhaps the CISO, and then the constituency that the SOC serves. So if we can immediately bring it into those three groups, we can start thinking about, okay, I need to, I need to create numbers really for all three of them. And, you know, a metric in one context is not going to be a metric in another. So for example, one of the metrics a lot of socks track is like outages of their systems and their sensors and um some people will probably think oh i'm gonna immediately take this and i'm gonna tell my CISO about every sensor that went down and lots of people have feelings about that and i'm not gonna do justice of different people having feelings about that but just thinking about audience and breaking it down in those three pieces can get you started yeah, I would agree with that. And uh, so for your leadership, um, you know, socks are expensive, whether you're one person or, or large, you know, security operations, you want to demonstrate your value. And you also have to be able to justify buying new tools, new stuff, you know, making sure we're, we're moving down the tools and um, the, the toys that analysts need to be able to do their jobs effectively. The best way to do that is to convince leadership through metrics about how much value they're getting out of their analysts and their tools and the technology that they're using already, right? So that's a goal when you're talking outside an externally faced set of metrics that you might come up with, for example. And, and that's where a lot of people run into struggle, right? Is like everyone knows that people want to know they're paying for something. And then you have this conversation where you sit down with someone who's way on a different tier than you of your organization. They're maybe not an IT person, a tech person at all. And you're like, hi, we're the SOC, right? And they're like, yeah, so what are you doing for me? And then you're like, oh, well, we found all this malware and all that, you know, and our ticket numbers and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, I, I don't know what any, is that good? Like, <laughs> so when you're having those conversations, like, uh, you know, the external metrics, as we'll, we'll call them here. Um, for people way outside the SOC, constituency conversations. What have you found to be some of the best ways of bringing and demonstrating that value to people who are wholly out of our realm of like normal conversation and terminology? Well, to start with, um, certainly what we found and what we've blocked, if we're able to say something like that. I mean, internally, you don't care about such things. But when you're trying to present something outwardly and, and upwardly, um, looking at how effective the tools are. So we were able to stop this. We were able to see this where we weren't before. Uh, we saw three, you know, intruders try to fish us, you know, anything that illuminates exactly what's happening in non-technical um, terms. One of the things that just kind of popped out there from the way you phrased that is um, the what we can do now versus what we had before. If you're buying expensive things, right? That's probably part of the storytelling, which is the other thing that's popping out is like people need it delivered in a compelling way. 
uh, you know, this, this story piece of, of metrics and, you know, the, the dangerous thing that almost happened and didn't happen because we saved the day and all of that kind of stuff. Um, that's, that's some of the things that I've run into. I don't know, uh, and, you know, in, in your experience, what um, uh, Ingrid and Carson, like thoughts on uh, ways of delivering that conversation or having that conversation uh, beyond what Kat mentioned as well? Well, yeah, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Ingrid. So I think this is where we start to get into the difference between kind of those those KPIs we talked about, which are ways that you're kind of measuring the steady state of what's going on versus something we haven't talked about, but it is also in the book, which is OKRs. And so that's kind of your objectives and key results. And that tends to come up when you're trying to change something. So you're trying to say, hey, you know, we want to reduce the number of, you know, phishing emails that result in installation of malware, like very basic scenario that you're doing. There's a lot of different things that you could do to get there. And so you want to say, okay, right now we get, you know, three of these each month that get clicked on and something gets installed. Okay. So our, or maybe the number's 10 to make it easier. And then you say, okay, so our goal is to get down to three. And so you're able to very clearly put numbers out, talk about what's happening, talk about that impact and show that change over time. And then you probably have initiatives that are going around how you're actually going to achieve that. So is it going to be user training? Is it going to be a sandbox that you bought, you know, and, and put into place? Is it going to be, you know, like what's going to stop you, you know, a new EDR, something like that. And then you can talk about how that technology fits into the scenario and the outcome versus just talking about the technology itself. And so I think if you really get into the changes you're trying to get into the environment and the impact that's going to have on your users, I mean, that's still a very technical scenario. You could expand on that and say, okay, we wanna reduce the number of times that a phishing, you know, a phishing email results in malware installation because you know, this is then the follow on impact that it has to that business unit when we have to take a user system offline or they have to, you know, it results in next stage, you know, actions or data get exfilled or whatever. So creating that scenario that's beyond just the, you know, the technical realm and the technology and talks to that business impact goes all the way back to strategy one, uh, you know, know what you're protecting and why, really getting those users involved. It's this, it's the storytelling. And we've had in some of our previous um, podcasts some discussions about storytelling and it's, impact or people who don't like it. And so that's getting to know your senior leaders and figure out if they're story people or not. Are they visual people? Are they numbers people? We really, we talked about this a little bit in communications and we talked about communications being a lot of verbal, but there's a whole kind of graphics element to communications when you're talking about metrics and you're talking about all of these other elements that has to come out as well. And unfortunately, this is an area where if you are not visually presenting well, then you're going to have a much harder time communicating this information. And so investing a little bit, whether it's in your own team or figuring out if you've got somebody within your organization that can help you put together your presentations around this can really make a difference. And I just bumped over a whole bunch of different topics there. And I talked over Carson to start with. So Carson, no, no, I talked over you. Um, so, you know, I, we could probably spend a lot of time talking about all of this. Um, I will be brief. When I think about using, talking about metrics at those levels, um, I really try and center myself and coach those around me to center ourselves in thinking about risk consequences in dollars. Um, and, and Ingrid very much, um, and Catherine both very much started um, talking about that. Um, I think about investments as Ingrid expounded upon um you know one of the one of the big things that um you know i see when experienced SOC incident leads and experienced analysts come to the table is they're not just talking about um you know the technical stuff but they're putting in the context of what that means to risks to the business and that comes with time and and we can use these metrics um, to tell that story, you know, in a retail situation, we can think about, you know, the number of point of sale malware alerts we got in the last 30 days, um, you know, or, you know, in a ICS SCADA situation, we can talk about um, the amount of uh, C2 um, that we saw in the last 30 days versus previous periods of times, um, you know, for uh, for IoT threats that are of concern. These are contrived, but the point is, is we're putting them in, in context. Um, 
you know, uh, one could have a, a very long conversation about dollar figures. Um, I would generally say uh, people often come to this this um, this place and and they f also feel very discombobulated. Um, you know, start with what's easy potentially, right? If you don't know where to begin, um, you can start at least wrapping your mind around about doing what's easy in terms of you know dollars to effectuate the full scope of incident detection investigation and response or dollar figures for the amount of personnel from the rest of the organization that we're involved in or um, you know dollar figures inflicted, inflicted due to an outage or service degradation. Those are places I, I start in those situations. And, and do you have some kind of conversation around when you are measuring outages, cost and dollars of impact, you know, where are we, is this a KPI really, right? Like, is there a bar where, okay, now we spent too much money, right? And we got that dial on the socks dashboard or something like that. Probably not literally that, but <laughs> the, you know, there, there is a amount of money that is too much and some that is an acceptable amount of loss, right? And so when it comes to talking with your constituency, um, are those the kind of conversations that we're having on a level that's not too deeply technical is like, what do you need for me to hit for you to be happy with me? Is that effectively the conversation? Well, and it, it um, you know, it depends on risk appetite. I would say there are also places to get started there. Um, the SOC should think about um, harmonizing the way it tells the story with, uh, or, with ordinary service delivery. Um, for the enterprise, um, if that's a strength, um, if there is an anti-fraud or anti-abuse um, practice in um, the constituency, that's another place to think about, you know, what's the language they're using and should we use some of that same language? Mm -hmm. And I think it's hard for organizations if you have not been through a major incident to have any idea what that threshold is going to be. Yeah. Um, even if they go online and read about somebody in their you know, particular industry and what has happened, it's not really real until it happens to you. <laughs> and so if you have an organization that has not had a major incident or you have a set of leaders who maybe have, themselves have not lived through that type of an incident, it's often hard to, to help express what that number can or should be. Um, until they've had to pay it, until they've had the legal fees, until they, and, and sometimes it's, it's not even about the, it's even hard to get numbers because you start thinking, okay, not just a dollar service delivery did our web, was our website up, could we sell? But there's things like goodwill, there's industry name, there's, you know, intangibles that can come up um, depending on the industry. Although we can have a whole nother discussion about whether cybersecurity is really a driver uh, for <laughs> whether you know, or people choose particular companies or not, um, you know, but that can, that can be a consideration as well. So it's, um, I think it's one of those where I would encourage people not to assume that their leaders will have a particular number, but work with them to say, okay, this is what's going on. How do you, you know, some of this is just gut feel. Some of this is, you know, what do you think when this particular thing comes up and start those dialogues early during some of the smaller incidents. So if you do have a major one, you already, kind of have a feel for where your leadership might be headed. Um, there's a, yeah. And sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to mention, um, we've dissected this into the three different audiences. Also think about this in terms of you've got metrics during incidents, like during wartime, and then you've got metrics that fall largely outside the scope of, of big incidents. I'll call that peacetime. So it separate one of the ways to approach this also separate your thinking into those six different quadrants. Catherine. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, I was just going to uh, elaborate on what Carson was saying. Uh, when I'm going through an incident, I actually keep a tally of how much basically this is costing. Um, everybody has incidents. It's good to know, kind of ballparkish, uh, what a, a what a little incident is calling uh, costing, and then start talking about how does that fit in terms of the intellectual property for the company or the business. You know, if it's a really small company, maybe you don't need 10 or 15 SOC uh, analysts working full time around the clock, right? So um, it helps you to justify um, when they know how much an incident can cost. There are some numbers out there, you can find them. 
uh, you know, I don't know how accurate they really are, to be honest. It's super hard to estimate. It's even harder when you're in the fog of war, as Carson had said, um, to sit there and keep track of exactly how much time and which tools did you use and which ones didn't work. And, you know, that stuff's hard to get a grip on, but you definitely should. Uh, there's one more thought, you know, um, we often as engineers, we want to be like really precise and like really accurate. We want to do it all the time. We want to over engineer everything. And one of the things that I would encourage the audience to think about is, um, is actually simplifying. Let me give you an example. Um, in the power industry, um, it is very, very expensive to run cable through power stations due to the very high amount of regulatory scrutiny and safety regulations that they're under, like just general regulations and safety specifically. And as a result, um, they have a dollar figure. I don't know what it is. I'm sure it's very high, but they have a dollar figure for like, it takes this many dollars to run one foot of cable you know, personnel, regulations, safety checks, recertification, blah, blah, blah. Think about those kinds of metrics in our venue. Think about, you know, maybe you need a metric for it. This, it cost me this many dollars or this many euros or this many whatever to like take F to field and drive to ground a false positive of X type. Because when you have those numbers, they illuminate stuff for your audience where they would have no idea what the costs would have been associated with that. And now they understand. And now they understand, wait, if I've got that number, why don't you want to do 10,000 more of these next week? <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, the, the simplify thing there, I think is a perfect segue into what I was going to kind of ask next about that is if we're trying to make this easy and, I, and I've heard you say, you know, all of you kind of impact and clarity and deliver an easy message, right. And in, in various forms, um, how many different metrics how how do we get it so we find that sweet spot where it's not an overwhelming wall of like numbers where it's just like yep that's a lot of numbers and they all look green or like <laughs> that thing where it's like well I, I don't know if that really gives me a good impression of what's going on here or not right where, where's that sweet spot of too much or too little or in between those two i like to start from what is a set of numbers where if if any of them are out of scope, you will actually take action. Because if you have 20 different, you know, numbers that you're looking at, and you say, okay, this is great. Uh, oh, look, seven, you know, seven of these are, are off track right now. Okay, we're gonna, you know, but we can only deal with one, or we're gonna open up all these initiatives, but we're never actually going to get them fixed or whatever else. Like, that's not helpful. That actually just creates a lot more noise. But if you have, you know, three, five, seven, whatever your number is of the things that you want to look at that are truly going to move the needle, and we keep talking about dollars, but it's which are the ones that are going to cause the biggest change in your security posture and the biggest potential return on value, you know, in terms of limiting cost and really reduce that down. Um, you know, I've, I've seen some very creative dashboards. Uh, you know, which will have 20 to 50 different numbers on them. And again, it's just a wall of you brief for two hours and everybody's face is glazed over and you don't see anything. I've seen some great presentations that have, I'll say in that three to seven range. And this is for briefing out of the SOC to external like stakeholders that are, are more senior and making decisions. And maybe you only get to meet with them once a month, once a quarter type of thing. You really want to have that limited set. You need to be able to like, Literally, if you're on the elevator with somebody, you need to be able to talk through those in the 30 seconds that you have for the ride. That, To me, that has always been where I found the right number to be for at least that particular audience. I think internal to your SOC, you can have more because your team is more closely looking and seeing those on a daily basis. And so you can make more um, changes to those uh, than you can with some of these bigger presentations. Yeah, the, the sock is looking inside the box, right? And we're trying yeah. to say, like, are all the components working? The, the analogy I use for this is, like, people buy a car, they just want to get from A to B, right? Like, that's the ultimate metric is, did you get from here to there? But, like, if you're the car mechanic, you got to dig in. You got to be like, oh, timing belts and get, you know, this and that, oil temperature or whatever. And most people are like, I don't want to know any of that. Like, I just want my car to work. I just want to get there. Like, don't bother me with any of that, right? 
And, and external metrics are a little bit like that. They're like, is the thing working? Am I safe? Am, am, am I going to be able to do my job? And like a lot of cases, uh, it seems like some of those things are, are a similar conversation, right? Like you have to show that you're doing something and all that. But um, it, it also, you know, it, distracting it out. You know, Ingrid really nailed it. It, it is very much audience and outcome driven. Um, I'll offer a couple more points here. Um, the tools that the stock brings to bear should align and fit into a larger and wider wider regimen of um, compliance um, tooling that the cybersecurity apparatus, you know, uses like, you know, is your stuff patched? Do you have AV on it? Is MFE turned on? You know, the usual things. And I'm sure they they change over time and that that the where that larger cybersecurity apparatus wants to be is it should be democratizing those um, those measures back out um, to its constituency so they can be actioned. Um, when they hold them tight, um, nothing happens. Um, this is one of the reasons why I frequently and, and consistently say, um, don't hide your vulnerability scanner results, democratize them to the owners so you can act on them for crying out loud. Um, yeah. So some of these metrics, when we talk about, um, you know, the wider constituency as an audience may take a very different form um, than what we're going to show um, executives. Right. The, uh, the word action has shown up several times as well. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that people always say is like metrics need to have some kind of, okay, what am I going to do, right? If your KPI goes above or below or anything like that. Um, any examples you can think of where you, you can think of like a commonly tracked metric that seems like it might be useful, but you found it to not actually be useful or actionable in any way? Anything yes. jumps in mind there? <laughs> yes, I have, I have stories. I have war stories on metrics uh, gone, gone awry. One of them is the number of incidents. It's a, it seems like a very simple thing. Let's just count how many incidents we have. And if we go down, we're more secure. Well, as it turns out, uh, human nature is that we're going to make those metrics look good and maybe we won't find as many incidents. So, you know, we're rewarding the, the, be the wrong behavior. So uh, we want to reward if incidents are going up, that means people are working harder. They're finding things. Right. So it's a very non-intuitive uh, count, but that's one of my favorite examples because it seems like that when you start out in a sock, and I was guilty of this when I first started. Yeah, let's count the number of incidents. If we go down, we're more secure. Yeah, don't do that. I I have feelings. Um, <laughs> Catherine <laughs> Catherine mentioned one of my favorite ones that are controversial. When I think about uh, measuring the number of cases, um, I think about it in the context of measuring. Um, efficiency and thinking about my personnel resources and my tooling and my automation in the SOC, not are we more or less secure? However, um, I do think about um, the number of cases when we are talking about confirmed true positives with, um, with the assumption of a steady state of set of detective and analytic capabilities, meaning, for example, you know, how many successful fishes did we have this month versus last? That's a very dimpl different implication than say a raw incident count. I would argue you should do both, but we haven't yet said, be careful what you measure, you might draw negative behaviors. <laughs> and that's exactly where I wanted to go with this is rewarding the wrong behavior is one of those things that I've certainly seen. I have had a ton of people you know, the students tell me like, hey, I'm getting this metric and they're pushing me to do X and that drives Y, which is totally not good for security. But hey, the reports look great. Right. Um, how do we stay away from uh, rewarding the wrong behavior? How do we identify those metrics that set us off in the wrong direction? Some of them are very obvious, mm -hmm. but like any kind of thoughts on that? I think this is where your quality program can come into play. So one of the uh less beneficial metrics you sometimes get is, you know, how fast did we close that ticket? Um, and that incentivizes you to just go, oh, nope, didn't find anything closing that one out. Oh, nope, didn't find anything there that, you know, and so it really has you get away from the quality of what you're doing and being creative and doing the searches and figuring out the, the thing that wasn't obvious when it's there. So if you feel you need to track that, um, in some way, then you need to have a quality program that is going to come on the back end and say, okay, 
what happened when that was closed out? Was that appropriate to close out? Was the investigation done according to our playbooks? Um, so you have to have that balance there that's going to put the check to say, okay, I need to do it, you know, maybe efficiently, but I also need to do it to this quality standard. And so those, those can really come into play. Um, hallelujah. Um, one of the things I like to think about in doing SOC metrics is having buy-in from multiple levels of the food chain, any metric we're talking about. And it might not be like the individual contributors all the way through, you know, four levels above them. What I am trying to say is we want to think about driving consensus. Um, there should be buy-in um, that we mean to measure something and what are the outcomes we're trying to drive from that. And it might not, not always, not everyone might always agree with everything. And sometimes you might have to mess around and find out. Um, but uh, yeah, consensus and quality program. Yeah. And, and don't be afraid to change something. If we have a bad metric and I, I, I don't know, guilty, we've had lots of uh, metrics that weren't working out. We simply tweaked them. We figured out, okay, that didn't get the behavior we were thinking. Let's figure out, okay, what do we want to account? So maybe we don't count the number of incidents, but maybe we want to account the number detected by a certain tool, you know, so you can tweak it. So it's still in that same family. It's just a different number. Yeah. A lot of the problems I think in, in my mind that I've seen come from when you are bunching a bunch of things together that are not the same and then trying to do match it like basically what you said before right counting all incidents it's like well some of them are an automatically closed phishing whatever the SOAR platform got it other ones are like very very complex and like yeah it, it's appropriate to take a longer time on some of them and it's appropriate to have more of one and less of the other and that you can't really capture that nuance you know, sometimes. And, and this is this is where i have seen people with grossly different expectations of where a sock is and its efficiency and effectiveness journey clash where they're going to like, we're going to show how really efficient we are. And it's like, yeah, but you don't know how to do that. So why are you trying to do show you're doing it faster when you suck at it? And, and this, this crushes morale in people when you, when it happens sometimes. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the big pieces here is growth mindset. We need to be ha being very honest with ourselves and each other and being open to changing our thinking as, as we learn and measure more. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to avoid putting my own commentary into this, but this is one of those things where like, I feel like I have to inject the one thought on this. Um, when it comes to that, right, being pushed to go faster, people feel that they are not doing as good of quality work because they're being incentivized to make the number look better. And then if you kind of walk that out, right, if you feel like you're going to a job and you're not making a difference and maybe making things worse, right? That's the worst kind of like burnout inducing bad stress. Uh, Cause you're like, I'm not doing anything of significance here, right? <laughs> I'm just kind of like making these numbers look good. And uh, that's kind of the worst thing that can happen. So like that, that would be one of my like flags of like, definitely watch out for that, stay away from that and, and think about how that, hurts the team when you incentivize the wrong this, thing. This is, yeah. And you're, this is, go ahead. Cap. <laughs> yeah. So you're headed in a neighborhood I was headed toward, which is a maturity model of some sort or mature. What does your maturity look like for the SOC? So Carson and Ingrid have both said starting simply is a great way to go. Um, measuring a few things to start with. So maybe that's a lower level of maturity. But to uh, keep you going as an analyst, uh, you have to feel like you're making progress towards something. Uh, a maturity model that starts to measure things as you go up uh, and get more efficient and more effective and, and maybe, you know, more advanced in your techniques um, is, is helpful in helping analysts as well as our leadership understand how we're doing. So one of the things I was thinking about is sometimes it's better to not have just a number. It's better to have a range yeah. or it's better to have a comparison kind of amongst yourself. So if you've got, hey, an incident of this type or an event of this type normally takes our team on average between 10 and 20 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. If things are between 10 and 20 minutes, you don't question it. If they're taking more than that time or less than that time, you, that might be something you go back and investigate later to figure out why. Is it somebody who maybe is newer and needs more training? Was it more complex? Like 
those are the outliers that you can look at. And then you as a team can collectively say, okay, how do we feel about that number? That's where we're at now. Do you think that you get the balance of quality and, you know, speed that you're looking for? And actually, you know, metrics, you know, measures, whatever we're calling them may come from the top down, but they should also come from your team internally. Like your team knows what they're able to do, where there might be um, places to optimize. And so have that discussion say, hey, for this type of incident, is 10 to 20 minutes a reasonable amount? Can we do something else? What could we do to get there? Oh, if we just had this kind of you know data that was integrated and we didn't have to go manually look something up on a different system, we could shave five minutes off that because we weren't logging in somewhere else, pulling in something from another database and trying to correlate it. Great, now you know that you can improve that in a reasonable way through technology. And it's not about what the people are doing, it's how you're improving the program overall. So don't think about it as just a, thing, a single static point. Think about it in the context of your organization and a range of things that you're doing right now and how you wanna move that range of um, measures that you're getting. Absolutely on point. One of the things I think about here is, is people often approach metrics in the SOC and they immediately go to, we need to establish like really hard targets and like run towards those targets and um, a mature and more balanced, uh, more mature organizations and a more balanced approach might be. You're using the metrics to establish an understanding of change in the business over time, because by this time, if you've gotten this far in the book, you've probably heard us say at least 372 different times that change is one of the things you need to be embracing in a SOC and driving. This is one of those ways. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, to, to kind of play the other side of that, I did want to ask one question to that is um, we know that pushing speed too hard can be a terrible thing to do, but how do we find when we are not doing what we could be doing and there is room for improvement because there is, you know, you can't take forever. Right. And, and there is some scenarios where it's like, yeah, the team could actually be doing better, but like you have to walk this tightrope of like not pushing too hard, but not pushing hard enough. So like, are there any signs you use or any kind of, you know, guideposts that we can look at to say like, here's the team we've got, here's the data we've got. Are we on one side of that or are we on the other side of that? Maybe I've just been really lucky, but I have never worked with a team that wasn't trying to improve itself, that wasn't looking for ways to do things more efficiently, that wasn't like, oh, if we if we only could get rid of this, I would have time to go do X. You know, there's, you know, and a lot of the measurements that we think about are around things that are, um, not as interesting sometimes because we spend a lot of time thinking about the actual events or incidents or other types of things where people are like, I want to go spend time hunting. I want to go do intelligence. I want to go do this other research that's going to help us. And so I think there's, um, one of the first things I will say is let your team loose on providing feedback on where they think the improvements could be. Like actually trust that your team is going to have some really great ideas that they're going to bring up. Um, and if they're not having those conversations, then there's probably other conversations to have about, uh, you know, creativity and engagement and opportunity and, you know, training and reading and things that they can do to get them excited about the other opportunities in that space, um, which is a kind of non answer, but it's, it's been my experience that it really is. Most teams are going to come up with great ideas. Uh, in, in, my Ingrid did a great job of describing one of the ways I really think about improvement in socks right now is this enabling all members of the team to say, I want to make this more efficient and there, or this more effective so I can do more of what of X or less of Y. And that's hair. I'm going to, I'm going to do acronym soup and I'm sorry, but uh, that is how we use KPIs and OKRs to drive that month over month improvement. And it, and, and it can come from all levels. It doesn't just have to come from management. Yeah, so my experience, I haven't been as lucky as Ingrid, um, but mostly it is a usually a conversation around expectations between leadership and the security operations. So I've been in that position, the hot seat, where it's like, why do you cost so much and why are we still getting hacked, right? Um, so metrics are a way of having a conversation around, look, we are getting better. 
we are doing things, uh, it, it makes the conversation concrete about here's how we're improving, here's how our analysts are working, here's what they're focusing on. Um, I've uh, you know, found it's invaluable actually to use metrics to be able to um, tell a story as Ingrid had said earlier about you know, how we've been moving along the chain. And if you don't have those expectations managed with uh, leadership, you're, you will lose funding. That's, you know, uh, you'll lose people. Um, you'll have unhappy people because they don't, they don't feel like they're being valued, right? It's when you, when leadership comes down, there's nothing worse than, than a leader coming down and saying, I don't know what you guys do in this dark room anyway, <laughs> right? So being able to explain it in terms, you know, uh, metrics is, is a super helpful thing. In, in terms of the um, collection and generation of metrics, any thoughts on uh, like what's the appropriate workload it should take to collect mm -hmm. and present and like prepare these things week to week? Uh, you know, I know the ideal is like you don't do anything, right? Um, but is this something where you know it's relatively normal to be spending you know an hour or two in Excel, like juggling around things? What are we aiming for there? Well, I certainly hope Excel is not involved, but it might be to start. <laughs> we all know Excel, it's always involved. <laughs> I, I actually dispute that. I, I, I actually dispute that. If you've got this down, you should not be involving hand jamming of spreadsheets in any form of fashion. <laughs> you should not. And yet I have worked with organizations that have had an entire metrics person dedicated to their security program who did nothing but generate slides, presentations, and materials every day, every week for different stakeholders. So <laughs> it does happen. Um, I will say that was a government, large government organization in the US. So um, there, were, there were many people who needed that information in a lot of different formats. <laughs> um, but yes, automation is your friend. Uh, this goes back to start with the things that you can get automatically through your systems figure out what is actually available to you, figure out how to actually use the dash dashboards, use the capabilities that are built in. Um, you know, a lot of times we do talk about, hey, start with your problem in mind and then back into what you actually want to do. This is one where sometimes, especially if you're just getting started, start with what's available to you and then figure out why you need to modify it. You know, then go back and say, okay, is this actually giving me that information that will get me to a cost, that will get me to you know, a, a proactive measure, something like that. But start with your tools, see what you can pull out. Um, please try and work with your leadership team on not having to do custom PowerPoint or your, you know, presentation, uh, you know, slides of choice um, on a weekly basis, because that is very painful. Yeah, and I will say if you go back to like what are the top incidents? So certainly phishing, right? So there are tools out there that will help you with blocking phishing attempts. Uh, you can get the easy statistics out of those. If you don't have that kind of software, perhaps that's something that's pretty high on the list to be able to to get in there first, right? Yeah. So you can use it kind of um, both ways. What metrics do you want to collect, and also what tools do I need to be able to to do these things um, together? It's yeah. And, and within your tools, it might be as simple as tagging something. Um, you know, you might have a tool that doesn't natively allow you to track something, but if you can figure out how your team can tag it as it's going through the process, that can give you a lot of value on the, the downside. I would, I would, for SOX looking to get started in this area, I would encourage folks to start with their case management system. If they've got nothing else, consider starting there and using that as an engine to drive rigor a repeat repeatability um and deliberateness around um uh, ticket handling and the metrics we derive from those tickets um i would also point out this is yet an another opportunity for a very well-meaning manager or lead or intrepid ic to create tickets that have 3769 different required fields don't do that um your analysts will hate you um be very thoughtful around that um, you know, and, and think about, and then go in, you know, go into the chapter. We've got three different tables in there to inspire you, um, to come up with metrics that, that think for you. But again, take that, take your investments there and line it with where you're trying to spell into calories in the business, like Inger was talking about a few minutes ago. 
Yeah, and he's mentioning table 24 and 25 for those following along in the book. <laughs> Fantastic. It, the uh, dashboard thing came up several times here, and, and I did want to get to that as well. Uh, any kind of general tips on what you have found to be useful or not useful to put on literally a TV that stays on in the room all the time or the virtual equivalent if you have a, the web page, you know, dashboard in your sim or whatever it is. Uh, what works and what doesn't work in that for metrics? I think uh, where I've seen dashboards be the most successful, especially in large organizations, is in peer comparison. So X group uh, was better at vulnerability management. They patched better than Y group, you know, and if that's like publicly there, um, folks are a lot more proactive about um, making sure things are, are, are done, especially in patching and things like that, where the constituency is responsible for that. Um, it's also useful for executives. They love to see colors and numbers. So making those simple for them. Yeah, ga gamification. I think Catherine is referring to gamification of security compliance among there you go. Uh, business owners. Yes. Uh, you can achieve a lot by making one people person more red than their peer. <laughs> <laughs> I may or may not have uh, seen that tactic used at a previous place I worked with. Not Excel, but Power BI. Excellent. The next evolved version of <laughs> presenting and manipulating data, right? <laughs> But yeah, um, no, that was actually uh, that, w that was a totally different direction. I was thinking more <laughs> internal SOC dashboards, but that's a perfect answer as well, because, uh, you know, I didn't even think about phrasing it about what should we put on the external SOC metric kind of dashboard. So, yeah, um, a great, great kind of tip there. No one wants to be the bottom of that, you know, list and, and uh, peer pressure on that can uh, bring up some difficult questions that people don't want to answer. Everyone wants to be green on that dashboard. Um, internal SOC dashboard the SOC analysts are looking at. Any thoughts on that specifically? Uh, what you've seen put on those, what you put on them yourself now? I'm going to like I'm I'm give you a sarcastic answer. So it depends on whether you want a decoy. You could have a pew pew map decoy so that you can, by the, for those of you not aware, when I say pew pew map, there have been many over the years. Uh, it's a it's a picture of the world with dots on it and 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 laser beams going from one dot to the next to signify the attacks and and they're in my opinion in the opinion of many people I've spoken with completely useless but they look cool and we see them in movies so um, a lot of a lot of socks and those that still have uh, ops fours to this day will still have pew pew maps. Yep. The tour dashboard, as we call yes. it. Yes. So all joking aside, yes, you might have a pew pew map up in your sock. Um, but in terms of what I'd actually put up there, um, I think it depends on what your competencies are and your audience and who you expect to be looking at their at that monitor. Um, I can think about, uh, you know, having threat intel feeds. Uh, I can think about having sensor status or data feed status. Um, I can think about um, having something about uh, case rhythm, case velocity, open, close, that kind of stuff. But again, I would double down on what Ingrid and Catherine and I have already said, and that is that we should be very thoughtful about those little micro behaviors we send when we put that up. Uh, we should think about the micro behaviors that we draw that we drive in terms of, you know, what's management looking like? I got to make that look good. If it, if that says I'm bad, like I'm bad. And like, so we just should be thoughtful about um, the behaviors we're driving. Ingrid. I think one area that I've found particularly useful for just internal SOC is anything where um, there's a time element to it. So maybe there's something that needs to be escalated. Maybe there's something where you do have a service level agreement and, you know, hey, we promised our constituency we would respond within four hours to this type of a threat. And you're about to go out of that agreement. And so you want something that's going to pop up, be an alert, let people see it, kind of know the status of your rhythm. This builds on what Carson was saying about the rhythm is know when there's something that needs action right away and where you need to get it in front of a bunch of people, because it's very easy to get 
focused on what you're doing on your screen, or maybe you're doing a collaboration with a, a team or something else. But if there are things that have to be done within a certain time, those are great candidates for putting up there and making sure that those alerts are, are showing up so that you take action on them and you don't end up missing out on something you're supposed to be taking care of. Yeah, love it. Time sensitivity, right? As opposed to the things yep. that may be very, very slowly uh, kind of turning over day after day. Yeah, it makes a lot of Those sense. Those would be your SLAs. Have your dashboards for your SLAs. Yeah, the things that you're you're being held accountable to, the things that you have to react on immediately, right? All of those things. Uh, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for for dashboard stuff. Um, any final kind of thoughts here? I think we've walked through most of the chapter, internal, external, talking about setting metrics, talking to the constituency, all that sort of stuff. Um, anything else before we close it up? Metrics are hard. Uh, good metrics are even harder. We wrote this, this strategy to have a lot of references in it. It does not mean that these are the right things for your organization. Um, and there are a lot of people out there who have put together different, uh, recommendations. And so, you know, it's worth, this is one of those places we're doing the Google search, figuring out what they've got, but evaluate them against some of the criteria we've talked about today to say, are they going to be right for you and your organization? And are they going to drive the right behaviors? Cause there's also a lot of, um, we would probably say very bad ideas for metrics that are floating out there as well. Yeah. And I guess my, my answer would be to, to keep it simple, just like we've been saying throughout, um, start simple, keep it simple. Three to seven, as Ingrid had said at one point. Um, three to seven things to count for leadership is a, is a good round number. Yeah. I would think about at every layer and every audience, what are the business outcomes? What are the behaviors that we're trying to drive? Um, and just be thinking about, um, the cost to implement those metrics, as we've stated, keep it simple. Um, and the cost incurred when people go look at them and people tangent from them and people don't do what you expected and and be ready to uh, fail early fail often fail fast great perfect wrap up all right uh words i extracted because i wanted to repeat them at the end here that i think that showed up enough uh actionability has to be an actionable metric clarity everyone has to understand kind of what's going on why you're tracking it simple easy to understand and relate to uh, striving for impact automated and repeatable, right? Solid list of things. Love it. All right. Well, that wraps up this chapter, which means we only have one chapter left. Amazing. We're getting at the actual end here. So next episode, we're going to be hitting chapter 11, which is uh, titled Turn Up the Volume by Expanding SOC Functionality. So be sure to join us. Uh, thank you to all of our listeners. Thank you to the authors for joining me again. And we will see you on the next episode of Blueprint.